Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the second webinar of Dan's 2021 series. Uh, we are, my name is Brian Harper, and I'm the Director of Communications here at Divers Alert Network. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matias Nichetto, who will be speaking to us this evening. Um, if you would like to uh, post questions in the chat, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of this event. So please uh, post those questions in the YouTube chat as they come to you. If you are tuned in via the Dan website, the event page on Dan's website, and you would like to participate in the chat, if you mouse over the embedded video player on the Dan website, uh, at the top, you'll see the title of this presentation. Uh, if you click that, it'll take you to Dan's YouTube channel. And there is where uh, the chat discussion will, will go on. So uh, please tell us where you're joining us from. We always like to know uh, where people are tuning in from. Um, and then, uh, yeah, post your questions as they come to you. I will be keeping an eye on those. And we will ask them to Dr. Nichetto at the end of his presentation. But without further ado, it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Matias Nichetto. Director of Dan Medical Services. Uh, he has worked uh, in that position since 2006. He is the co-director of the Dan UHMS Continuing Medical Education Program and a faculty member of several national and international diving medicine courses and programs. He became a dive instructor during medical school, which led him to complete a three-year clinical and research fellowship in hyperbaric and diving medicine to combine those two passions. Tonight, he will be presenting Pressure Change and Barotrauma, How Diving Affects the Body's Air-Filled Spaces. Without further ado, Dr. Nichetto. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope everybody's doing fine during these difficult times, but we're getting, we're getting through it and hopefully we'll be fine and recovering some degree of normality uh, soon. So without further ado, I'd like to start this presentation. So as you know, we're going to be talking about our traumas. Our traumas are by far the most common diving injury. So let's jump right in. Okay. So we're going to be talking about bowel traumas, both pulmonary bowel traumas, which are clearly the most uh, concerning, the most uh, frightening, and extra pulmonary bowel traumas. Those are the most mundane, the, the easy ones, or the ones that at some point in your life, if you don't have a middle ear bowel trauma, it's probably because you haven't been diving enough. So what is a bowel trauma? So bowel trauma means injury caused by pressure. Baro comes from the Greek weight or pressure and trauma, which means wound or injury. So it's an injury or damage caused by pressure and the difference between two cavities. So these two cavities are usually either gas, gas, or gas liquid, and sometimes liquid, liquid. So the main culprit of barotraumas is, of course, physics. Many of you probably remember Boyle's law, right? So the pressure of a gas decreases as the volume increases. This was described by, by Robert Boyle. And that's for those uh, geeks like like to remember the, the, the mathematics. That's what it is, right? The ideal gas law. So initial pressure times initial volume over initial time equals final pressure, final volume uh, divided by final time. So this is this is the, the ideal gas law. And if we remove each one of those components, we have all the laws that derive from it. So if we remove temperature and we keep temperature as a constant, that's when we have Boyle's law. This is the corporate. This is what we're going to be talking about today. If we keep volume constant, then we end up with Guy Lussac. And if we keep pressure constant, we end up with Charles Law. So this is essentially what we're going to be talking about, right? So we are concerned that the deeper we go, the smaller uh, these gas fetal cavities tend to uh, appear or tend to, to convert to. So we know that up to when we descend just 10 meters, right, or 33 feet, that is equivalent to two ATA, two atmospheres absolute, <clears throat> any gas-filled cavity will be reduced to 50% of its original volume. When we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we descend another 
33 feet, we add another uh, atmospheric pressure, the pressure, the change in, in volume is not that significant. It only reduces to a 33% of the original volume. And as we keep on moving forward and we keep on descending, this is not linear. As you can see, the deeper you go, the less the, the significant the, the changes in volume. That explains why we have to equalize so many times on the first 33 feet, but between, say, 70 feet to 100 feet, we'll need to equalize that often. That is explained by just pure physics. So what is the application of Boyle's law in, in barotraumas? So we know that the human body is a combination of solids, liquids, and gas, right? And when we think about this, the first things we think of is, of course, the gas-filled cavities we have in our skull, the sinuses and the ears, the ears themselves, and of course, the lungs. But these are not the only gas-filled cavities we have. We have many others, and some of those, like the gastrointestinal tract, they are internal. And then you have the molars, right, the, the dental pieces, that they can cause some degree of biotrauma. And we have external or neocavities, so cavities that are not in our human body, but they are part of, of us as a unity, as a dive, as a diver. So the cavity, the gas filled cavity, the space between the mask and our face, the space between a dry suit and our body, and eventually some implantable medical devices that the concern is they may have gas in them and pressure might deform them and make them fail. So if we want to organize barotraumas, we can organize them in both internal barotraumas and external barotraumas. Among the internal barotraumas, we have the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat barotraumas, and we have external ear barotrauma, middle ear barotrauma, and inner ear barotrauma. Then we have some issues with the mastoid process, which is essentially part of the, the middle ear. We have sinus barotrauma, facial baroparesis, and alternovartic vertigo. Then among the pulmonary biotraumas, again, these are the most concerning ones, we have all the forms of extra alveolar air. We will go through them, and eventually the most concerning one, an arterial gas embolism. Then we have the gastrointestinal biotraumas. Then we have dental biotraumas. And among the external, <clears throat> we have uh, biotraumas caused by the mask. Those are the facial biotraumas or the facial squeeze. The external ear biotrauma can be caused by some masks. And then we have suit and implantable medical devices. So let's jump right into external ear biotrauma. So just reviewing ear anatomy, we know that the ear is comprised of three distinct portions. The external ear, which is from the pinna, that is the, the ear itself, and all the ear canal up to the, the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. Then we have the middle ear, which is the cavity, the tympanic, the tympanic cavity, that air-filled air cavity that contains the ossicles and some uh, muscles and some uh, tendons. And finally, we have the inner ear. Now, important that the inner ear, although it is part of the ear, technically speaking, that is part of the central nervous system. The inner ear is filled with liquid, and you don't want to mess with the, with the inner ear. So beware. Many times, although we tend to not pay that much attention and not be concerned with middle ear biotraumas, sometimes a middle ear biotrauma can cause an inner ear injury. And this will not only keep you out of the water for a long time, but it could potentially have long-term consequences and permanent sequelae. So I wanted to share with you this image that I find absolutely fascinating. So this image is uh, essentially a camera looking from the inside of your middle ear. So we're witnessing the middle ear here. So that is the eardrum. And here we have a, a, a tendon, the tensor tympani and the muscle. And then we have this other cord, which is the corda tympani. This is just the tendon. Here we have the malleus or the hammer. We have the anchors or also known as the anvil. We don't get a very clear look at the stapes, but it's there. And finally, this bulging structure that we have in front, that is promontory. So this fantastic image is, do you see that little like depression there, like that uh, uh, ditch? So that might actually be the, the opening of the eustachian tube. This is when we pinch our nose and we blow. That is how we inject air into our middle ear to equalize pressures. 
This fantastic, lovely image comes from inside the living body. This is a documentary aired by the National Ge Geographic Channel. Beautiful, beautiful image. So when we see the image, sorry, the ear from the outside, which is usually the only way we can assess uh, not only the ear's anatomy, but its function and, and structures, what we see with an otoscope is this. So that is, with an otoscope, the way we look into the ear, and what you're seeing is the tympanic membrane. Now, there are many things that we look into to find out and to determine whether or not there may be an injury uh, in, in the ear. So this is normal anatomy. Everything you see here is absolutely the way it should look right now for each one of you. So that is the tympanic membrane. In the tympanic membrane, we have this reflection here that we call the, the cone of light, and that gives us an idea on which side is the chin. And we use that to find out or to determine whether or not someone is equalizing the ears properly. Every time we ask someone to pinch their nose and blow gently, we will see this cone of light moving. And then we know that the tympanic membrane is bulging either outwards or inwards. If we ask them to equalize and it doesn't move that much, it is possible that there is a tear in the tympanic membrane. This is the umbo. This is the, the the protrusion of the inner, the middle ear also goes into the tympanic membrane. That is the hand of the malleus. This is the anterior malleal fold, posterior malleal fold. This is the pars tensa, and this is the pars flaxida. So important thing, many times when we have an, a middle ear by trauma, the tympanic membrane may rupture. Sometimes we hear people calling us and they say, listen, I had troubles with my ears. I was trying to equalize and I was unable to. And I had some pain, but all of a sudden the pain stopped. I heard a pop and the pain stopped. And when you ask them, sometimes they'd notice or dive body noticed some air coming out of the, the middle ear. So that is clearly a perforation in the tympanic membrane. Now you would say, but how come it didn't, it didn't hurt? Well, if the tear is in the pars tensa, it may actually not hurt at all, and it may not bleed. This is a very thin uh, membrane composed of only three layers, and there are no terminal nerves and no blood vessels. So it doesn't hurt, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't bleed. Now, when the tear or the tympanic membrane rupture is significant enough, it may actually affect the pars flaxida. And here we do have uh, uh, innervation nerves, so it, it does hurt, and eventually it bleeds as well. And finally, we have here the long limb of the incus. That's another fold. So what is an external ear biotrauma? So the cavity involved in an external ear biotrauma is, of course, the external ear. So the challenge is when we use earplugs or some type of blockage on our uh, ear canal. So that can be earplugs, this uh, vented earplugs that sometimes they 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 can be popular among divers. We receive questions about these a lot. We usually don't recommend them because water will always find its way, and it's not clear exactly how they work and if they work fine. We have consulted many ENTs, and they usually don't recommend them. You know, so you have some masks, some fancy masks, that they tend to, to have these this, uh, pockets to keep your ears in them. They won't make equalization any easier. They may keep your ears drier, but they won't help in equalization. And sometimes the obstruction uh, between the, the ear canal and the exterior is actually a very tight hood. We will see that on, on, on the next slide. And sometimes it's a combination of many different things. So the thing is, every time we have a blockage in the ear canal, we form a new cavity in the ear canal between the tympanic membrane and this obstruction. And there's no way to equalize it. So here we have it, right? So the ear canal, if we put an earplug, that's the cavity, right? No way to inject air into that cavity. And if it's not an earplug or, or some external uh, 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 cotton ball or something, it could actually be the neoprene. It does the same thing, right? It blocks the, the, the middle ear canal. So what happens when we have this blockage is as we keep on descending, the pressure increases in the ambient, right? But we don't have any way to equalize it. So eventually we inject air into the middle ear and now we have positive pressure outside, positive pressure in the middle ear, but we have a relative negative pressure in the ear canal. So 
we say that you know the when we put earplugs, the earplugs will tend to join or meet in the middle line. So either the earplug will go into your ear or the tympanic membrane will bulge outwards and and have an injury. So that is that is usually how you you end up with an external earbud trauma. This only happens upon descent, right? If you have a blockage in your middle ear and sorry, in the external ear and you ascend, the blockage, the gas will eventually expand and dislodge the blockage. So usually when this happens, if you feel anything like this in your external ear, the only thing you have to do is to, you know, make your, your hoodie a little bit loose and, and ascend a few feet and that usually fixes it. So to what degree can this be dangerous? Usually with an external ear of trauma, you don't see much. So there are a couple of, of different ways to, to measure or to classify uh, ear injuries. And this is one of them. This is the O'Neill uh, grading system. So an O'Neill grade zero is everything looks fine, right? There are no signs or symptoms of anatomical change, no trauma, but the patient complains of some pain or some discomfort. So that is an O'Neill grade zero. And eventually, in more serious cases, you may have an O'Neill grade one, which is some local erythema, some local redness around the tympanic membrane, but no, no real, uh, no significant damage. So for the most part, an external urobar trauma is a fairly benign uh, injury. So we covered external urobar trauma. You will see I'm going to be repeating this slide over and over every time we check off one of the different barotraumas. Now, remember, we talked that you know, your biotrauma can be internal, but it can also be caused by external sources, the mask or the suit. So that's why I'm crossing it also over there. Middle ear biotrauma. Like I said before, this is by far the most common diving injury. At least 50% of divers will suffer a middle ear biotrauma at least once during their diving career. So the costs for these are usually poor equalization technique, sometimes descending too fast, and sometimes when we dive with a congestion after coming out of a cold, we have allergies, the eustachian tube may be a little bit dysfunctional and we cannot inject air into the middle ear. And when we push it, eventually we end up with a squeeze. The symptoms may range from anything from just a discomfort, a mild discomfort to severe pain. Sometimes the tympanic membrane ruptures because eventually something has to see, right? There may be bleeding. We talked about that before when the tympanic membrane is ruptured in the pars tensa, the, sorry, in the pars flexida. And of course, when you have inflammation and swelling, uh, all these structures in the middle ear, they need to be per working perfectly fine. Any swelling will cause a decreased hearing. Tinnitus, which is the fancy medical term to say ringing in the ears. You can have sometimes vertigo, and that usually causes or may end up with nausea and vomiting. And sometimes uh, the, the decreased hearing may end up in hearing loss. So to what degree this could be dangerous? Well, the palate is wider here. You can have something like an O'Neill grade zero, meaning again, no anatomical damage, nothing, nothing visible, but the patient complaining of uh, pain. We can have an O'Neill grade one, with the local redness and erythema around the tympanic membrane. And sometimes the eustachian tube is shut down. There's so much swelling that usually the next day, uh, the patient will complain of some popping, some crackling on the ears, and they feel like there's water. Because indeed, as you can see on the image on the right, you see some bubbles. The, when the eustachian tube is dysfunctional and it's blocked, your middle ear will flood with liquid. Now, I want to emphasize that this is liquid, not water. This is not water from the ocean. This is liquid from your own body. When we have the middle ear that is unable to equalize, unable to vent, naturally the middle ear will flood with liquid. This per se is not something dangerous, but this creates the perfect environment to culture an infection. So every time you hear some popping, some crackling, a day following a dive where you had some difficulty equalizing, you may actually suspect this is what is going on. Give us a call. We can probably help you determine if how likely this is this is happening, and we can recommend best course of action there too. Now, sometimes things get a little bit worse, and you have an O'Neill grade two. So this is when we have significant bleeding uh, around or, or behind the tympanic membrane, and sometimes there's tympanic membrane perforation. So. 
for all of us who are divers and for those of you that are like leaders, I think this helps, right? So when do we need to equalize? How can we uh, prevent this from happening? I've always used this, uh, this comfort scale and making the analogy with the traffic light. So there is a safe zone, there's a safe moment for you to equalize and there is an unsafe one. So if right now we're not having any issues with our ears, we're in the green, right? We feel fine, we hear fine, no pressure feeling, no pain, no nothing. Now, if you start descending a few feet, initially you will feel some pressure discomfort. It's not pain, it's just a discomfort. It is okay to equalize up to this point. Now, when you go past beyond the point of discomfort and you start feeling some degree of mild pain, this is already too late. You should not continue to descend. You should actually ascend a few feet, go into the green or the yellow zone, and then try again. So what are the consequences or complications of the middle ear bar trauma? So one of the consequences is what I said before, right? Sometimes the following day after a dive where we had some troubles equalizing, we may feel some popping, some crackling, that is what we call a serous orthopathy. So that is fluid behind the tympanic membrane. Don't use Q-tips. The, the water, the, the liquid that you feel is not reachable with a Q-tip. Even if you go deep enough, you're going to feel pain by pushing into your tympanic membrane before you can actually dry it out. Again, it's on the other side of the tympanic membrane. It's not reachable. This usually causes a muffled hearing. And again, it's the perfect environment to culture infections. Sometimes the tympanic membrane may rupture. That is going to keep you out of the water for a while, uh, weeks to eventually months. And sometimes the repair of the tympanic membrane just doesn't happen by itself and it needs to be surgically repaired. Sometimes this can result in an inner ear bar trauma. When the squeeze is significant enough, you can be actually pulling uh, structures from the inner ear and end up with, uh, with a significant injury into, again, the inner ear is part of the central nervous system. So... We don't want to mess with that. And the mastoid bowel trauma. So the mastoid bowel trauma is a bowel trauma of the mastoid processes. What is the mastoid process? The mastoid process is the bony structure you have behind your ear, right? If you touch behind your ear and you see this bulging bony structure, that is the mastoid process. Inside is a combination of many different cells of air, right? It's like a, like a sponge. And every time you equalize your middle ear, you're equalizing the mastoid process. It, it is not that common, but it can happen that people have pain there, and that could be a mastoid process or mastoid bowel trauma. So we checked off mastoid bowel trauma as well. Let's go now into the inner ear bowel trauma. This is, this is concerning. This is no joke. So this is damage to the inner ear due to pressure differences caused by incomplete or forceful equalization. So the image that you see there, that is a beautiful renderization, uh, animation of the cochlea, the inner ear. Remember, this is a cavity that is filled with liquid. So if it's filled with liquid, we cannot compress it, right? You, liquids are, for all practical purposes, uh, uncompressible. So you have a bar trauma because the pressure within our skull is transmitted into the inner ear and eventually it can cause a rupture of the inner ear into the middle ear. So there are two ways. One is what I just described, right? So internal pressure transmitted through the middle through the through the skull, through the in, increased intracranial pressure. And also sometimes it's from the middle ear into the inner ear. So back to ear anatomy, we have the inner ear on the right, we have the round and the oval windows, and when the pressure increases in our skull and increases into the inner ear, eventually the only way where the inner ear can release some pressure is through the round or oval window. So if we do forceful equalization maneuvers, we may actually tear these very delicate structures and we have a leakage of the perlymph, which is the fluid that is in the inner ear, into the middle ear. Now, as you remember, the inner ear serves both for audition, so for hearing, and also for balance, for equilibrium, and for spatial orientation. So this is a very, very delicate structure. When you have an injury here, 
your brain will be confused because you, we have two inner ears, right, right and left. And when they, when one of them is having an issue, our brain gets confused and we lose spatial orientation. So the symptoms is an acute and sudden onset of vertigo. So important thing to remember: we tend to sometimes mix things up when we say vertigo and when we say uh, a dizziness. Dizziness is the feeling that the floor is unstable, right? I can walk, I can talk, I can, I can function reasonably well. I just feel the floor is unstable. Now, someone that has vertigo, he or she has a spinning sensation. So either he's spinning in the environment or the environment is spinning around him. So vertigo, you're dysfunctioning. You can't walk without assistance. You would fall. Usually someone with vertigo has their ears closed, sorry, their ears, their eyes closed because every time they open their eyes, they feel everything is spinning. They feel everything is spinning because they have nystagmus, which is this jerky movement of the eyes uh, from, from side to side. You may have tinnitus, right? They're ringing in the ears. There may be a degree, a variable degree of hearing loss. And, and most likely you will feel fullness in the ears. Complications, the perling fatty fistula that we talked about before, this leakage into the middle ear, permanent hearing loss, and again, inner ear infections. Again, no joke. This is part of the brain. The challenge with inner ear biotrauma is clinically, it may look very similar to inner ear decompression sickness. We're not going to be talking about inner ear decompression sickness here. One of the, the key things to distinguish one versus the other is a very exhaustive anamnesis, so a very exhaustive interrogation from the doctor. Usually on one, there's, the, there's a history of difficulty equalizing, and the, the onset uh, is not so acute. Now, this is perhaps one of the most uh, challenging situations for a hyperbaric medicine doctor, distinguishing between one and the other because although they show exactly the same or they may show very similar clinically, the treatment on one is contraindicated on the other one. For someone that has an inner ear decompression sickness, the treatment is recompression. And for someone that has an inner ear bar trauma, if you put them in a chamber, they will have to equalize their ears. And if they have a leakage, the last thing you want them to do is to keep on leaking and making the, all the situation worse. So when in doubt, what we usually do is we treat and we do a myringotomy. So we do a small tear in the tympanic membrane to have to, pre to prevent the patient from having to equalize, okay? Again, I'm giving you more than what you need, but I think it's important for you to understand that you don't want to mess with your inner ear. Next, sinus biotraumas. So we know we have uh, four groups or five groups of sinuses in, in, our, in our skull, right? We have the frontal sinuses, the ethmoidal sinuses, planoidal sinuses, and maxillary sinuses. Now, when you have pain uh, descending, usually descending on your forehead, that's usually a sign of a frontal sinus biotrauma. If you have pain behind the eyes, either ascending or descending, that is usually a sign of ethmoidal sinus biotrauma. Now, the maxillary sinus, it may actually show like pain right there or show like pain on your upper teeth. We'll, we'll talk about that. And if you have pain that is clearly associated with vertical travel, right, going up or down in the occipital region, that is usually a sign of a sphenoidal biotrauma. So this is a referred pain. It doesn't hurt necessarily here, but your brain understands the pain is coming from the occipital region. One of the most uh, common uh, um, manifestations of a sinus bowel trauma is uh, epistaxis. So epistaxis is the technical term to say a nosebleed. It's technically not a nosebleed because it's not bleeding from the nose. It's actually a, a leakage or drips of blood coming from the sinuses that drip into the nasal cavity. And depending on where it drips in the upper part of the nasal cavity or in the lower part, you may actually have something that looks like a nosebleed, nosebleed you may actually be spitting blood because the, the drip falls through the oropharynx and you actually spit it out. So when you have someone spitting out blood, usually people freak out. So I'm not saying this for you to try to distinguish between is this a sinus biotrauma or is it choking up blood? When in doubt, of course, ask for help. Give us a call and, and seek medical evaluation as soon as possible. But know that not all uh, blood dripping from the nose or from the mouth is necessarily something that you should freak out for. Just give us a call. We'll help you out determine what are the chances. Now, the complications of a sinus biotrauma 
can be serious. One is a pneumocephalus. And if you break down the word, the etymology, pneumo means air, and cephalus means skull or head. So yes, you have air in your head, air between your brain and your skull. That is not fun. And sometimes you may have air behind your eye, retroorbital emphysema. So if you remember, what is the number one rule in diving? If you have troubles, don't dive. If you have troubles equalizing, sorry, don't dive. And what is the number one rule we all break? If you have troubles equalizing, ascend a few feet and try again. And if it doesn't work, ascend a few feet and try again. And just keep on repeating this until eventually you manage to squeeze air into the sinuses or the ears and Bob is your uncle. Well, that's great. That means you manage to descend and, and start your dive. Now, eventually you have to finish your dive. You can always abort descending, but I have yet to see someone aborting an ascent. So if you had troubles descending and you pushed and eventually managed to squeeze air into the sinuses, well, that is only half the way. When you go up, nothing guarantees this air will vent out, and it may vent out in the wrong direction and break in uh, other structures. That is actually what's happened to, what happened to this young girl. So she had troubles equalizing, and when she was ascending, she heard some, some pain, some acute pain, and shortly after ascending, this is how she presented. And she mentioned that when she was touching her eye, the, 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 the eyelids, everything looked puffy, like there was gas there, because there was gas. So this is not necessarily something that serious per se, but if you think about it, if you have troubles with your sinuses, it's chances are because your sinuses had an infection. And when your sinuses have an infection and you have air going into places where it doesn't belong and behind the eyes, well, so think about it. The sinus had mucus. And if it was an infection, there's probably germs. So now I have air and mucus and germs where they don't belong. So never, never underestimate troubles equalizing, please. So another uh, interesting uh, bowel trauma is what we call a facial baroparesis. So what is this? So what we're seeing here, this is the middle ear looked from the inside. This is a much clearer view than that original picture that we had before. And you see there at the top, I think I can zoom in there, right there, if you see that, that uh, yellow thing that crosses the middle ear, that is actually a nerve. Normally, the nerve is covered by bone, very, very thin bony structure. Um, and on top of the bone, of course, there's mucous membranes. Most of us, for most of us, the nerve is actually well protected from the pressure changes in the middle ear by this thin layer of bone. But some people, and this is what we see here on the right, uh, at the bottom right part of the screen, the bone, there's a dehiscence, there's an opening in the bone and the nerve is only covered by a very thin, flexible mucous membrane. So when the pressure changes in the middle ear and we have an uneven equalization right and left, eventually the pressure in the middle ear can squeeze the nerve and we end up with what the gentleman has here, something very similar to a Bell's palsy. So you see someone surfacing from a dive and they have half of their face completely paralyzed. Could you freak out? Well you should definitely ask for help and that diver needs to be evaluated as soon as possible. One of the, uh, the differential diagnoses for this is of course a stroke. So you don't want to underestimate that. Now, there are clinical ways to determine if this is a central paralysis or a peripheral paralysis. I'm not gonna go through that, that is beyond, uh, beyond this, but do know that uh, it may just be that. It may be a facial paralysis. Uh, usually you see this in new divers, not because of them being more susceptible, but if you have the bone dehiscence and you've been diving for many, many years, this would have probably manifested very early on. Um, so again, bottom line, someone surfaces from a dive, they have an uneven, asymmetric face, stop everything you're doing, take them to an emergency room, have them evaluated, give us a call, we'll try to help. Alternovartic vertigo. So what happens here? So when we fail to equalize our ears evenly, right and left, and one ear ends up with more pressure than the other one, 
again, we have this sensory system and all the information is going to our brain through right and left. And when the, the, the information coming from one or the other is uneven, is asymmetric, our brain gets confused. So what we will happen, what we will suffer is from a very acute sudden onset of vertigo, right? The spinning sensation. This is a very similar mechanism to what happens with caloric vertigo. When, you, when water goes into one of the ears and all of a sudden you lose spatial orientation. The phenomenon is very similar. So this is sudden onset, usually associated with barometric changes, right? Going up or down. There's usually a history of difficulty equalizing. And sometimes you ask for it and they say no, but when you start scratching the surface, there's usually some degree of of difficulty equalizing. The risk is, I mean, the alternative body vertigo per se is not a, a dangerous thing, it's a benign a phenomenon. Uh, the risk is when you're underwater, if you lose spatial orientation, that could lead to confusion, panic, and drowning. Okay. The management is whatever you are doing, undo it. If you were descending, well, stop descending and ascend a few feet. If you were ascending, well, stop ascending, try to equalize and try to go back down a little bit. The challenge is, of course, when you have troubles while ascending, eventually you will have to surface. The prognosis is actually really good. Usually this resolves spontaneously within minutes, eventually it could reach to an hour to, to full resolution. If this lasts more than a few minutes and, and this is getting any worse, there may be other things to consider, including inner ear bar trauma and inner ear decompression sickness. So again, give us a call. We will try to help you determine what is the most likely scenario. Okay, pulmonary. These are concerning, indeed. So what we see here is a beautiful animation of the alveolar sac from the outside. So each one of those uh, bubbles, so to speak, that is the alveoli and the net of uh, capillary beds around it where we oxygenate our blood, right? So the cause of the pulmonary trauma is air trapping, either bronchial due to a bronchospasm or mucus, either the glottis, usually caused by panic and sometimes coughing, and eventually can also be caused by capillary bleeding. This is more rare and usually secondary to uh, relative hypovolemia, so uh, an increase in the blood pool in, in our lungs or in very aggressive free divers that do competitive diving where the difference in pressure between the inside of the lungs and the outside is absolutely brutal. Now, when you're in the alveoli, this is a color-enhanced scanning uh, electromicrography, and what you see there, those are the capillary beds from the inside. And that very thin layer, semi-transparent layer, that is the only thing that separates blood from air. That is what oxygen has to go through to go from the alveoli into the red blood cell. So you can see it's a very, very tiny structure. We see the red blood cells going one by one extremely, extremely delicate structure. So when we're adding pressures and pressure changes and holding our breath and ascending and descending, this is why we're so concerned about someone holding their breath. The minute you start stretching and forcing the structures, something may break. So the risk here is a rapid ascent. Sometimes the control emergency swimming ascents uh, are known for sometimes causing severe injuries. Uh, it is not uncommon for us to hear someone complaining of something that sounds very uh, much like a pulmonary blood trauma. And when we asked them, they were actually practicing this. Uh, panic can lead to pulmonary blood traumas. Of course, when we panic, we forget about everything and we just hold our breath and go up like a rocket. In some out of air situations and in, in military people, submarine escape training is usually associated with pulmonary blood traumas. Uh, COPD, of course, uh, and body breathing and a history of underwater coughing can sometimes lead to this. So what happens is, what I said before, any form of extra alveolar air. Extra alveolar air is air in your thorax, but out of your lungs. Essentially, between your lungs and the thoracic wall, that is a pneumothorax, or between uh, your heart and the cavity where the heart is, that is a pneumopericardium. And sometimes it's in between both lungs in the mediastinum, which is the space that contains the heart and the big blood vessels, that is a pneumomediastinum. And then a subcutaneous emphysema, when you have air in your mediastinum, eventually air dissects the planes and goes up and tends to accumulate here in the base of your neck. 
So you have air on the base of your neck, right underneath your skin. That is a subcutaneous emphysema. And if you're unlucky enough, you may actually have an AGE, an arterial gas embolism, when air goes into the bloodstream and goes up to the CPU, and we have a very, very serious case. So gastric biotrauma. Here's when we start with the more esoteric ones and intestinal. So the theory or the concern is that sometimes some gas filled cavities in our gastrointestinal tract may uh, be incarcerated or uh, strangulated and the gas can't expand and can't flow in and out or, or back and forth in the gastrointestinal tract. And of course, when we ascend, this could eventually cause the, the, the hollow organ to, to burst. This is really rare. I mean, sometimes we hear someone complaining of, you know, abdominal pain or, 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 or uh, retrosternal pain while ascending, and they call us after the fact, and they say, I was here, I was having this very severe pain, and when I surfaced, I had the most uh, remarkable belching ever, and, and all of a sudden, everything went away. Well, most likely, that is what was going on. <clears throat> um, this is not to be taken lightly. I mean, this could be potentially serious. At least in our experience, we have never heard of anybody having any, anything serious, but it could potentially be, be complicated, particularly for those that have uh, hernias in the abdominal wall that are unrepaired or um, um, an eventration, right? When, when part of the, when they had a repair and, and it just lost its, its tension. <clears throat> Okay, so dental one. So the theory is dental biotrauma can be caused when you have a, an air pocket left on a cavity repair, either due to a loose amalgam or a valve mechanism between the loose amalgam and, and the space. So the symptoms usually pain, and typically the pain is upon descent, nothing upon ascent. When you ascend, well, eventually the, the blockage is, is, is loose and, and gas vents out. Um, the, the differential diagnosis here is with a sinus biotrauma. Sometimes we hear people saying they have pain while descending on their teeth. And so the question we ask is, do you have any repaired cavity there? If the answer is yes, well, then we don't know if it's a sinus biotrauma or a dental biotrauma. If the answer is no, positively sure that they don't have any, any cavity and any, any loose amalgam in, in, that, in those teeth, well, most likely, even though it hurts, the tooth hurts, is most likely an upper sinus, a maxillary sinus biotrauma. Okay, and the the reason for this is the nerve that innervates both the dental pieces and the sinus itself is the same, and we our brain can distinguish one versus the other. So the mechanism is uh, again the loose amalgam, and the complications are cracking and explosions. This was described in in jet fighters. Uh, in pilots where they ascend uh, to incredible heights in such a short time that this was described as that happening to them. This is probably exaggerated, so we have never heard of anything like that happening among divers. What else? Let's start with the external ones. Let's go into facial, a facial squeeze or a mask squeeze. So the cause is failure to exhale through the nose during ascent. Again, keep in mind you have this uh, gas cavity or this gas space in between your face and the mask. And there's a reason for why the nose is inside the mask, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to equalize this cavity, right? That's why we don't use goggles while diving. So <clears throat> usually this only happens upon descent. As you go down, the gas compresses and the mask tends to uh, do a big hickey with your face. Now, it won't happen upon ascending. When you're ascending, eventually the gas expands and releases the mask and loosens the mask and, and, and you don't have any issues. The risk factors are, of course, a very poor fit. Sometimes the, the, the reason is the mask is too tight. Remember, the, the strap on your mask is not to make your mask air and water tight. It's just to hold the mask in place. Water and pressure will do the rest. So when the mask is too tight, you may actually risk leaving the nose out of this cavity, and that makes it difficult to equalize. And then poor training, and sometimes people being overweighted, not overweighted because of being obese, but overweighted carrying too much weight. 
where they descend, they have very poor neutral buoyancy and they descend faster than they can equalize. So what happens when you have this hickey over your, your face is what we see here, right? So they surface and shortly after they say, hey, my eyes look, I have a hemorrhage on the wide part of my eye, on the sclera. And sometimes it may look really, really bad, right? The good thing is usually this is far, this looks far worse than what is actually concerning. As long as there are no visual disturbances, and as long as you can see there on the, on what you see on the right, on the left eye would be, when you see, if you see hemorrhage going beyond the white part of the eye into the cornea, into the colorful part of the eye, that is potentially concerning. But other than that, it usually looks really bad. It's not that bad. Divers should know that it usually gets looks worse before it starts looking any better. It will go from a red into a dark a red and eventually blue, and then into a, a green, and then from green to yellow, and from yellow back to white. That is the way we metabolize blood, and those are the changes you will see. Give us a call anyway. We would like to ask you a few questions uh, to make sure that this is nothing to be concerned about. Okay, this could be concerning if you're taking aspirin or if you're anticoagulated. So always give us a call. Suit squeeze. So the cause is again, we have gas pockets in between the dry suit and, and our body. So either a very poor fit, the suit being too loose, or having little or no undergarment, sometimes a rapid descent that doesn't give you enough time to equalize and to inject air into the dry suit, and of course, poor dry suit training. Now, the concerning thing here is sometimes it may look very similar to skin bends, and so that is a differential diagnosis. Of course, the exposure has a lot to, to, to say and to, to offer whether or not it was a deep dive or not, and, and how it looks. This is actually a dry suit squeeze, and we can see there that the, the, the markings, the bruisings, they tend to be symmetric right and left, and they actually follow the same pattern that the seams or the flaps the, on the suit would follow. So for the untrained eye, yes, this could look like skin bends. Uh, usually with a few questions and maybe an image, we can help steer in the right direction. And finally, implantable medical devices. So the risk or the concern is that among the many implantable medical devices is some of them, they may have a gastric cavity. And we know that when we're descending, everything that has gas is potentially, well, it has to be uh, governed by gas loss, by physics. So the concern is what happens? What if they malfunction? What if we distort it? What if we deform it? And we have an, a defibrillator, well, not a defibrillator, but a, a pacemaker and it starts failing. So. This is a concern, but we have never heard of anything bad happening. Now, the, in terms of the pacemakers, which are perhaps the most common question we get asked about, uh, all of these, the vast majority of the new pacemakers, they are approved to use up to certain depth, not because they were thinking on you going diving, but because maybe they were thinking that you might need hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Um, the device itself is probably going to be okay, but what you should probably do is to ask your doctor to tell you exactly what type of device you have and ask your doctor eventually to find out to what depth this device or to what pressure, not depth, to what pressure this device was approved and, and tested to operate within normal limits. Most likely, this will very rarely exceed 40 to 60 feet. And there is always a CYA policy and the manufacturer will say, listen, we try this in, in lab environments. We don't recommend doing this. Again, we can help with that. Uh, sometimes the most concerning thing is not necessarily the device itself, but the reason for the prescription of the device. So again, give us a call. We can help there too. To put things in perspective, this is some stats from uh, one year that we looked into in 2011 about how many times we recorded cases with barotrauma as the keyword. So in just one year, we had 494 cases with some type of barotrauma. 69% were middle ear barotrauma. Overall, 87% were ears and sinuses. 
and the rest lungs very, very few. Usually this number is exa exaggerated because we tend to think of worst case scenario, not because in 10% of the cases we had a lung trauma. We mark them as potentially because that's what we want to rule out. And face, relative, face mask, relatively rare, but not that uncommon. And teeth, very rare too. Usually most cases is actually a sign of trauma. So in conclusions, Delta P, the, the, the changes in pressure, is usually the driving force for many dive-related injuries. Understanding the role of physics in diving can help elucidate the mechanisms of injury as well as the complications. Now, for those of you that are doctors, being a diver will really help you through the anamnesis, through asking the questions to your patients and help elucidate the mechanisms of injury as well as complications. And finally, for everybody, never ever underestimate the energy stored in these small spaces. Okay, and that is all I have for you now, and I think we now go to questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Nichetto, and thanks to all of you for being here, uh, joining us this evening, and a special thanks to all DAN members, without whom we would not be able to do educational outreach like this. Uh, great turnout tonight, love seeing people from all over North America, US and Canada, uh, Hawaii, New Zealand, Trinidad, Mexico, Argentina, India, Belize, Taiwan, Malaysia, and right down the street here in Durham, North Carolina. So lovely to see you all. Um, all right, a couple of questions for you, if you are ready, Dr. Nichetto. Um, yep. Question from an amateur freediver. Uh, Nikki asks, why does my ear hurt while surfacing? Okay, why your ear hurts while surfacing? Well, I can't tell for sure, but the first thing that comes to my mind is a reverse squeeze. Remember, equalization while descending is an active process, right? We need to pinch a nose, blow gently, and inject air into the middle ear. Now, equalization upon ascent is a passive process. Usually, we don't need to do anything, and gas will vent out through the same way it went in, through the eustachian tube and into the part, the back part of your throat. Now, if for whatever reason your eustachian tube is uh, clogged, it, it is not that permeable, eventually, when you have an overexpansion in the middle ear that can't be vented out, your tympanic membrane will bulge outwards. And remember, part of the tympanic membrane has nerves and blood vessels, so it will hurt. You may have troubles ascending, and you have to ascend very slowly until maybe you hear a, hi a hissing and the pain is manageable or it stops. That is usually very, very suggestive of a, a reverse block of your middle ear. All right, thank you for that. Um, next question is for David. If I feel that I have water in my ear, what is the best way to dry that liquid? Okay, so I think if you're coming out of a dive and you did some movement with your head and you know sometimes you're a photographer and you went upside down and you did a funny movement and you felt water going into your ear, well, that is likely just water in your ear canal. Maybe it goes really deep and the complication there is if you don't dry it soon enough, you may have a middle ear, sorry, an external ear infection. You will notice this in the next couple of days when you touch your ear and you move your ear around. If it hurts, if you feel it's hot and, and swollen and it hurts when you move your ear, that is usually a sign of a, an external ear infection. Now, if you had troubles while descending and then the next day or that same afternoon without having any more issues and you never felt water going into your ear, and you feel like this popping, this crackling, and you, you move your ear and you feel like there is water, that could be a eustachian tube dysfunction. Is your middle ear flooded with liquid? And again, you're not going to be able to reach it with the Q-tips. It's on the other side. Now, if the water is out, if you know it's just water in your ear canal, just make it, try to dry it however you can. Maybe sometimes use a, a hair dryer. You can use some, some uh, um, uh, isopropylic alcohol to try to dry it out. I mean, not much you can do. Sometimes you don't need to do anything. It just goes away. Keep in mind and pay attention to this repeating. And eventually, if you feel this uh, pain while touching your ear, moving it around, that is an external ear infection. Just go to any doctor. They can prescribe some drops and usually goes away within a couple of days. 
All right, thank you. And here is a question uh, about grading barotrauma severity. Is there a difference between the O'Neill system and the Teed scale? So they're different. You know, some people prefer one, the others prefer the other. Uh, O'Neill, it's, it's, I feel it's, it's practical. Uh, it gives you a fairly good, it's not that academic as, it, as the Teed scale. But it's practical, and I think for those of us that are not ENTs, that is something that it helps you group things together into what you should do with one and the other and what to expect with one or the other. It's just a different one. All right. Um, okay, here's another question. I've noticed vertigo when I bend over to drain seawater after a swim. I'm not fun. So you notice vertigo. Okay, so a spinning sensation, not dizziness. When? Uh, when she's bending over to try to drain seawater out of her ear after a swim. Oof, I would like to ask so many questions there. I mean, it could be, it could be what we know as benign paroxystic positional vertigo. Sometimes, you know, in your ears, you have the semicircular canals. Those are the three axes, and that helps us keep spatial orientation. Sometimes when we do these uh, significant movements, these provocative maneuvers, we may have we may dislodge this uh, tiny uh, like stones we have in 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 this semicircular canals, and that may trigger some degree of disorientation and vertigo. But that is a, it's just an educated guess. I mean, one would have to ask many more questions to give something that is useful, right? Great. Um, all right. What about LVADs? What are LVADs? Um, sorry, I don't know myself. Let's see. We've got any more. So yes, for to the person who asked about LVADs, um, just post again if you wouldn't mind letting us know, and we will come around to that. Uh, but in the meantime, we will move on to what about replacement joints such as hips, knees, or shoulders? Do these present any issues with regard to barotrauma? No, no. With regard to our trauma, we have replacement joints. They don't have any gas field, part, any any gas cavity. So no. All right. Great. Um, let's see. Um, okay. What is your thought on including hydrogen peroxide in an eardrop recipe? There are many home brews uh, uh, recipes for trying to dry your ears. You know, it's it's. It's complicated. It's uh, debatable. Some people are really okay with them. Some others, not so much. The thing is, what are you using them for? If you're using them as a precautionary measure, you probably want to ask your doctor what is what he or she recommends. Uh, if you're trying to prevent something that has already happened, well, you don't want to pour absolutely anything in your ears uh, when when you don't know if your tympanic membrane is intact. Um, hydrogen peroxide per se. Uh, pure, it may not be the best. Uh, sometimes you may want to either do a different preparations, and again, perhaps the doctor is the best one to recommend something like that. I mean, we we try not to recommend uh, these things so lightly. All right. How about um, nosebleeds upon surfacing? Any thoughts on what might be causing it? I think we, we cover that a little bit with the sinus biotraumas. Nosebleeds, when you have someone surfacing from a dive and you see them, right, they have their mask on and they didn't re even realize and you see some traces of blood in the mask and you point it out to them and say, hey, dude, your, your nose is bleeding and they don't even felt anything. Chances are that was a, a sinus squeeze. Um, if there's no pain, it usually goes away and it was just that. Now, if you have pain, uh, that, is, that could be something more serious. Uh, it's, if it's associated with other symptoms, it, it is worth asking. Now, in any way, if you have someone that surfaced from a dive, no pain, no nothing, they never realized, and you see some traces of blood, we know that it's likely sinus biotrauma. Beware on the second dive. Chances are this may happen again. Cool. Um, and I'll jump in right quick to let everyone know uh, that if you would like to watch this video again or if you'd like to share the link with anyone who couldn't make it tonight, uh, this video will live on Dan's YouTube channel. So it will be accessible on the event page on the Dan website if that's how you're, uh, you got here. And it will also live on the uh, 2021 webinar playlist on this YouTube channel. So 
we hope you do share it uh, with anybody else who might enjoy seeing it. Um, okay, next question. Uh, Dr. Nichetta, near the end of the presentation, we have a uh, percentage data from around 2011. Um, is this typical in more recent years? Is there any uh, trend up or down in th those numbers? No, no. It's a, it's just a, a, a slide that I've been carrying over for years, but those numbers don't change that much. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Moving on a little bit. Um, all right, what would you say uh, to someone who wants to die but suffers from severe intestinal gas? Um, is there any danger associated with this? Okay. Um, well, we know that gas, while descending, will compress. The challenge is sometimes when we ascend, it expands not necessarily where it was before, so you may have to vent that gas. Um, again, we know it potentially could cause some issues. We have never heard of anything being more than perhaps some pain and some some uh, significant belching or uh, um, towards the other end. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, the concern is perhaps with people that are known to having hernias particularly at the abdominal wall, right? When you can have a, a loop of, um, of intestine in which you have gas and eventually if it expands, it has nowhere to go. So that could be, that is much more concerning. Okay. All right. Of course, if anybody has pain and, and the pain uh, uh, persists uh, minutes, many minutes or hours following a dive, well, I mean, clearly the direction is seek medical evaluation, right? right. Um, if a diver suffers inner ear barotrauma, will that result in a greater chance of equalization trouble in the future? So if a diver suffers from inner ear barotrauma, will that result in further equalization issues? Not necessarily, uh, as long as you don't recreate the same conditions, mm -hmm. right? But I mean, having an inner ear barotrauma some, in some cases, the recommendation is you probably shouldn't be diving anymore. Mm -hmm. In some cases, uh, maybe it's it's okay. Each case is its own universe, but um, not necessarily. It won't make you more prone. Again, unless you repeat the same or the same conditions are repeated, right? All right. Um, so another question about um, the use of an otoscope. So um, mentioning that, that otoscopes are now available in uh, Dan's uh, store, dan.org slash store. Uh, is this a useful tool for those with a rescue diver or more advanced uh, first aid training? I think it's an interesting skill to develop and you need to look into many people's ears to have an idea on what is normal and what is not and how the ear anatomy, particularly the ear canal, uh, changes between people. Um, it doesn't hurt. I mean, if you're doing it with some training and if you ask your doctor to give you a clue on, on how to look into someone's ears, it's it's okay. It's, it's, a, it's a safe practice. I think it's an interesting thing to do. Um, now, if you don't have any medical training, it's not like you know, you're going to be diagnosing things. If you see something really wrong and you see blood, well, you know that something is wrong. Is it a T2, T3, only a 1 or 2? Well, that is probably beyond what, what lay people should worry about. Mm -hmm. But if you do it routinely, soon you will start seeing things and, and understanding what, what a normal uh, ear looks like. All right. Um, next question. Uh, what makes buddy breathing a risk factor for pulmonary barotrauma? Is it because divers are more likely to hold their breath during buddy breathing? Right. The concern is if you're ascending and you're holding your breath, well, you need to make sure that you're not holding your breath too much or ascending too fast. Right. Yeah, little stream of bubbles or humming, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, LVAD, we got a definition, a left ventricular assist device. So an implanted um it sounds like a planted device for uh left ventricular okay and the question was uh just uh, about uh barotrauma risk with that device and i assume that the answer is the to consult the manufacturer yeah it's the same each device again each device they are approved to 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 work under certain environmental conditions and that includes temperature pressure and so on 
Now, technically, when the device is manufactured, they put it they put it in an autoclave, so they increase the pressure, they increase the temperature, and if the device can tolerate that, it can most likely tolerate a dive. Now, you have to go through the manufacturer's recommendations. Some devices, some old devices, they have more limitations. The newest ones, they usually are okay to up to 12 meters, so 40 feet, 50 feet. Probably the most concerning thing here is not the device per se, but what is the reason for the prescription? Okay. All right. Um, okay, a couple more questions. Um, okay, has dancing any value in ET balloon dilation therapy? That is a great one. I think um, a few months ago, maybe more than that, uh, there was a lot of discussion on whether or not this is something that could help people equalize better. So what, what this is, is eventually they put a balloon into your station tube, they inflate the balloon and try to make the station tube dilated, make it more permeable. That is more a question for an ENT. It, it makes absolute sense. Now, is that something that one should recommend to all divers? No, absolutely not. Is that necessary? Some people may need it. Will you need it for diving? That is perhaps more a question for an ENT. Uh, if if you don't need it for your normal life, again, I'm not a specialist there, but I, I have a hard time thinking that you actually need it for diving per se. But I mean, it's a, it's a it's a procedure. It's ENTs are doing it, and it's it's a safe procedure, right? Great. Um, and how about sneezing underwater? Do we know of any potential barotrauma issues associated with that? I don't know. I think the key here, and on one slide, I had something about that, about forceful equalization. Sorry, not forceful equalization, but forceful maneuvers underwater. Um, it is not uncommon that when someone is doing some type of, you know, recovery of a heavy object, sometimes they go into look into a, a, an anchor line that they dropped or a, a, a boat a engine. Sometimes, yeah, it, it's not uncommon for people to end up with 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 symptoms, and it's not clear why, but. There seems to be an association with very forceful maneuvers underwater and mm -hmm. pulmonary blood traumas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, clearly, while you're changing depth and lifting heavy objects or sneezing, there is a point in which you're holding your breath. Mm -hmm. so you don't want pressure changes or depth changes at that point. But sometimes, even still, when you're at the same depth, like you're at the bottom of the ocean trying to recover a heavy object, we have seen cases that, again, we can't explain exactly why, but there seems to be an association with pulmonary traumas, pneumothoraces, uh, when doing these activities. So recreational diving, just take it easy. Don't do anything forceful underwater. Don't mm -hmm. do sneeze. If you have to sneeze, well, you have to sneeze. Try to keep it at the same, the same depth and not do any dramatic uh, sneeze, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, another question about uh, breast implants and it, are silicone or uh, saline favored for diving? Doesn't really change anything. They don't contain any water. There were research studies trying to really damage these implantable devices, putting them into absurd depths. You can hardly do any damage to them. Okay. Um, perhaps the only concern with breast implants is not the breast implant per se, but the straps on the BCDs whether or not the, the surgical procedure was too soon, and maybe the straps may compromise the pocket in which the implantable, the, 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 the breast implant has to lodge, right? Got it. All right, well, I believe that concludes our questions and that concludes our presentation. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Nichetto. Thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks most of all to Dan members for all the support. Um, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. We hope you will join us next month. Uh, Frauke Tillman's PhD uh, will be presenting a, an update on Dan research in 2021. Uh, that will be on Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. And we hope to see you there. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining right. us.